Hello there, dear listener. We have just released the final episode of the classic campaign Taroticum for Cult Divinity Lost over on Patreon. If you head over there and back us at the $5 level, you can already today binge all 25 episodes of this twisted and horrific tale. The support we are receiving there is what is keeping the podcast going, and if you want more Red Moon roleplaying, do consider supporting us there. Thus far, we have released the first four episodes of the show, which covers the prologue here in our main feed. And today, we are releasing the first episode of the main part of the campaign, where we are introduced to our main characters, Vahid Karimi and Jennifer Carver. Now, sit back and enjoy, and do check us out on Patreon. The sun has set on the British Empire... It's a dotard with illusions of relevance in a world that has long passed it by. Its legacy one of destruction, genocide, slavery, the eradication of thousands of years of culture and history. It rammed predatory capitalism down the throats of its subjects, who are now hard at work, destroying what is left of the wilderness of the world. The sun is set upon London, too, a city of contrasts in 1992. Respectable businessmen rub shoulders with punk rockers. Buildings of steel rise from medieval quarters. Luxury cars glide past the homeless. And beggars panhandle for a few pence in the city's prosperous heart. London is both immensely rich and devastatingly poor. The consequences of the broken promise of a better future for all will not be felt just yet. But it's coming. You see a dusty room... Bookshelves along the walls and a very, very heavy desk made of oak. On the floor sits a young woman wearing a white jacket. She lays out cards in different patterns in front of her. Tarot cards. She speaks backwards, but you understand perfectly well what she's saying. I'm in grave danger. My child is in danger. It's your fault. You must right all the wrongs now. As she looks away, you see that the jacket is marked with the words Sandburn Psychiatric Hospital. The dream pulls you away from her. She reaches out her hand as you're pulled back, but disappears as the door to this room closes. You are pulled down a stone stairway and through a weed-choked garden of sorts, the green leaves and bushes surrounding you, then through a high wall with imposing gates. But the gates are open, beckoning you to enter, to find her, to help her. It is your fault, after all. You must right all the wrongs now. You hear a metallic clank as though a great breaker has been pulled, and all becomes black. Jennifer Carver. When all becomes black, you return to a familiar place. The fire. She is on fire. It must be Sarah. Immolated just like the monks in Saigon. The horrible smell of burning flesh screams. The banging on the door from your parents, trapped in their bedroom. James passed out on the floor, slowly asphyxiating. His friend Sarah reaches you. Her face a giant burn wound and her eyes charred. Somehow she is alive. She grabs onto you and falls on top of you. Her body is as hot as ash from a campfire that has just gone out and you scream as your flesh is seared. I want you to roll to keep it together. I scream. I scream. And I scream. It's all here. I don't want it to be here. Eleven. Then you shall choose a condition. I will, of course, be haunted by this experience later. I mean, I always am, but I hadn't had one for so long. I haven't had one of these for so long. I close my eyes. It's not relative. It's not relative. It's Dr. Finn's words. She always tells me to say, it's not relative. That means 
what I'm seeing is not that it's real or not real. It's that it isn't relative to what you actually feel. This is... I feel calm. Therefore, I am not here. And this is not happening because I feel calm. And I am calm. I am calm. I am calm as I just sort of rock back and forth trying to blot out everything I'm seeing in this hellscape of horror, fire, and... And you awaken from the nightmare. You find yourself sitting up in your bed. You're sweating. You you remember every detail of what you saw vividly. The dreams of the fire you can never forget. But the other dream, that was new. You've never seen that girl before. There was something about that place, though. Like, like you recognized the place. Like your, your amygdala screaming to you that something happened to you there, but your hippocampus refusing to connect it to any actual memory. I wake up outright in bed. I scream. I can't help it. I have to. After a few moments of screaming, I... I reach for the glass of water by the bedstand. I... I go to the windows and I make sure they're closed. They're closed, yes. They are all closed, yes. I always keep them closed. They're still closed. The shutters are down. Mm -hmm. Just like Um. you left them. (laughs) I go back to bed and I start to cry a little. You do just that. The clock radio shows the date. It is December 18th, 1992, and it is a Friday. Today is your therapy session with Dr. Finn. Oh, huh. Looking at the clock, you see that you seem to have overslept. You better hurry if you want to make it. I wipe my tears. How foolish of me. I'm going to be late. I rush to get dressed. I put on a simple cardigan, uh, a basic dress. I'm a mess. It doesn't matter, I'm late. I so and I go and take my pill. I, one in the morning, one in the evening. I go and take my pill. I have a glass of water and I look at myself in the mirror. I... <laughs> I'm in my, you know, almost late thirties now. Um, I have dark brown and hair. I... long nose. My eyes are puffy from crying and I look strained. I look an absolute mess. I always do look an absolute mess. There's no time, no time. I do my best to get my things, get my purse. I'm going to go see Dr. Finn now. She'll help. She always helps. I just feel so angry though. I've been doing so well. I've been doing so well. And I go and leave my small flat in Kensington make my way to the psychiatry. Yes. How do you travel there? By foot or by car? I can't drive, (laughs) of course. I couldn't pass the test. I wouldn't want to drive anyway. No, I'll... I hate getting public transport. I need to get a cab. Yes, I'll get a cab. I'll order a cab. You hail a cab, and it arrives... Where to? Where is Dr. Finn's office? It's around Green Park. It's a nice little psychiatrist um, establishment. Just a little ten minutes from the station. From the park itself, actually. Yes. Um, Green Park, please. Uh, 452. The uh, Milton Institute. Certainly, ma'am. And uh, the, the cabbie he drives off. The radio is on and... You can hear the normal news. It's centered on the collapse of the Soviet Union and the consequences of that that horrible coup in St. Petersburg. A violent thing that was. And uh, the driver leaves you alone. Do you like that? Do you like it when people talk to you that you don't know? Or do you like them to be quiet? I enjoy them being quiet. I don't know this man. I don't know what he wants from me. I mean... Mm. I sort of correct myself. He's just a driver of a cab. 
There's nothing wrong with the driver of a cab. No, oh, he wants your money, that's all. Yes, that's right. And I just focus on my purse. I don't like looking out the window. I don't look out the window. And the cabbie is absolutely professional, and he drives you to your location in good time. And you find yourself arriving maybe two minutes before your appointment. I'm not actually that late, somehow. That's wonderful, that's good. I get out, I pay him quickly, and I walk into the the Milton Institute, which is (laughs) a sort of psychiatric care area in the uh, establishment. Not, of course, like a hospital. Uh, It's much nicer than that. Hmm. And uh, as you were about to enter there, you pass by on the street. There's a there's a homeless woman that's sitting outside on the way today. She hasn't been there before, dressed in rags. You can you can smell the stink of urine and filth even from a distance. She's drinking directly from a bottle of Gordon's, talking to herself. Seems to pay you no mind. And I pay her no mind. I leave her to whatever demon she's facing. I wonder what demons she has. No. No. Just a poor old woman. I should feel pity. I should feel sympathy. Mm, Another day. I go into the office. Yes, and you are greeted by the secretary, and you're led into the office of Dr. Finn. How is the interior of that place? Ah... Lovely. Uh, Dr. Finn's office is a carving place. Lots of bookshelves filled with various clever-looking books. Uh, There's some good stuff up there, actually. It's not all uh, psychiatric stuff. I've read... She lent me one once. A a nice, you know, a nice bit of uh, Wuthering Heights. It's a nice book. There's some pleasant landscape portraits on the wall. Simple things. Grass, trees. That's all that's needed. There's a large potted plant in one corner and a nice long sofa, of course, to sit upon. She keeps the office very organised and tidy. Although, she does have this one silly thing on the desk. One of those little metal ball toys, you know, the ones that you sort of throw and they go back and forth, back and forth. I like that. The room has white walls and a light blue carpet, and is lit from the outside by a small window uh, that's quite bright during the day, although of course she will close it for me. She knows that that makes me comfortable. And she arrives. Dr. Finn arrives. How does she look like? Dr. Finn is a lovely woman. She has blonde hair, wears some quite fashionable glasses actually I believe she's in her late 30s as well or maybe just approaching 40 she looks good for her age she wears a little bit of basic makeup and dresses smartly but again she is always so pleasant she is a kind doctor she's the kindest one I've ever had really She understands, you see. She's always understood more than the others did. And she greets you with a hug. It's great to see you, Jen, she says. Why don't you sit down? I... She points you to the sofa. Make to sit. As she hugs me, as always, I stiffen incredibly. I have to fight the urge to let out a scream. But it's okay, Dr. Finn. It's okay. She's fine. And she knows only to do it for a few seconds anyway. She says someday, maybe one day, maybe one day I won't mind it. I look forward to that day. And I retreat quickly. I smile. I sit down. Hmm. Yes. What shall we talk about today, Jen? What... What is on your mind? I lie back on the sofa kind of want to cry again and I kind of just hold it in because no no not now it's unbecoming of me but I do sound very upset oh 
Dr. Finn, I've... I was doing so well, but I... I had dreams again. I took the pills. I I, I took them. I, I've been doing so well, but I, I, I don't know what happened. I, 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 I dreamt again. You dreamt? What, what sort of dream was it? The same one? Yes, and I tried my best to avoid thinking of it at all, and it's strange because as I avoid thinking of that dream, the other dream surfaces just a little. Y- yes, um... It was the usual one, but uh, funnily enough, though, I actually, I actually had something else. Um, that's funny, isn't it? Uh, having something else. I'm not supposed to be having any dreams, and then I have two. Is that maybe? Maybe I haven't been taking a strong dosage. Perhaps, but dreaming is natural. What? What did you dream? Oh, silly. Um. Someone was playing with some, uh, 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 cards. Someone was playing with some cards. I don't know what, why she was playing with them. Huh. Hmm. Cards. What, what did you feel when you, when you saw that dream? What, was it a good dream? No. She wanted something from me. I, mm, I, I feel an inward twinge because I know that when they want things from you you mustn't listen but no, no, no we're fine we're fine she wanted something from me but I I didn't listen they can't want things from me if I don't want to do them, right? yes, right that's right, Jennifer that's right and she and she sort of reaches over and and, and, um, pats you uh, on the shoulder that's right yes and it's only a dream dreams are just our subconscious dealing with the experiences that we've had. They don't really mean anything. It's it's good that you're dreaming of other things than well than than that thing that we're working on. And and I'm 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 happy. I hope that you can dream I hope you can dream normal good dreams again, Jennifer. I think I think that would be very helpful for you. I don't really seem certain of this. I'd rather not dream at all dreamless sleep, which I have for months now been having on this medication, but um, well if you say so doctor, but um I don't know No, I understand I understand, and and sometimes new impressions and new experiences they can they can be scary And, and it's okay to be scared of them so don't worry about that but let's talk about something else, shall we? Something more pleasant. Let's talk about your life. Let's talk about what's what is exciting about your life right now. I pause for a moment. It's funny, I always find this question hard to answer. What is exciting about my life? Nothing, really. I smile. Oh, well, actually, uh, I've... I've, you know, the, the students have been nice lately. Uh, it's good to take my mind off things. Um, I've been trying to brush up on my maths actually, because I'd like to include that in my, uh, my curriculum. Um, yes, I, I have a few nice students. Uh, uh some some nice young, young ones. Uh, one or two older ones as well. O- only a few, you know, only a few. I wouldn't want more than that. But it, it's fine, and you know, I. Get a lot, get a good, good help at home, and um, oh, and um, ha, huh. actually, finally, uh, my my brother rang me recently. Isn't that strange? Your brother? You've spoken many times of your brother. I thought that that you hadn't spoken for a very, very long time. We haven't. He wasn't. Um, he he left a message actually, and uh, he didn't respond. I look a little annoyed then. It's always the way, isn't it, Finney? I actually tried ringing him up, and, and he doesn't even respond. He doesn't even respond. He likes to say he'll be there to help, but he never is, is he? Never is. Such are things with family. They they should always be there. We, we expect them to always be there for us, but when they aren't, we, we are disappointed. But but Jennifer, do, do, not, do not forget that he is, he is family. He is... 
he's someone that you should treasure. And and I hope you get a chance to speak to him again soon. I I think it would I think it would be good. I think it would be good if you would be closer. You and him. I sort of frown very heavily. I disagree completely. But I nod. Maybe you're right, Dr. Finn, maybe you're right. I I just find it hard. I appreciate the money. Money doesn't make up for it. You know that. It, money money doesn't make up for it. I'm sorry, I'm getting I'm so sorry. I'm I'm, I'm getting anxious. I, I'm sorry. Oh, don't worry about that, Jennifer. No, you I fully understand why you feel the way that you feel and and I think you should just remember that it's probably your brother trying to to show how how sorry he is. He he must also be thinking about this often about about the things that happened and I'm sure he would want to take it back if he could but but such is life there are things that we cannot change what we can change is who we choose to forgive and how we choose to treat those that are around us and, and Jennifer I hope that I hope that you will come one step closer to to being able to forgive him I think holding on to grudges is is only going to weigh us down yes it's only going to make our heart heavy and we don't need a heavy heart, do we? No. You're right, Dr. Sin. You're right. You're always right. I... I don't know why. What... What, why, what, what do you think's gone wrong? What, why Why did I have I suddenly had... Uh, had, a, had, had this t- tonight? I, I've been doing so well. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm stressed about something else. Is that possible? What do you think? Is there... Is there something going on? that might have caused these dreams to appear all of a sudden? I don't know. I thought I was doing well. Hmm. I... Um... Hmm. Well, Christmas is approaching and there's a lot of excitement going around. There's a lot of stress. and It could just be that, you know. Not everything has to be... Hmm. Has to be terrible memories and fires of corpses and charred bodies and flesh melting and searing smoke and... I sort of started staring at her quite intently and I just go, Ah! Um... And I kind of just... I'm confused. Did she just start... Why was she saying those things? Sorry, did did I say something? No, of course you didn't. You just got this look on you, like, 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 like I had said something. I, 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 I thought you started saying some horrible things, Doctor Finn. I'm sorry. I, I, I thought you started talking horrible things. I'm, I'm sorry. Of course that didn't happen. I'm sorry that didn't happen. I, Jen- Jennifer, it's 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 all right. You you're under you're obviously under stress, and and I think it's it's been good that you have been able to talk about those things today. I. I see that our, our time is, is coming to an end here, and it's always great to see you, Jan, and I, I, I truly believe you're, you're becoming better. I, I, can, I can feel more and more confidence from you every time we meet, and, and, and I hope that you will continue taking the medication and, and continuing, you know, doing the things we've talked about, yes? Of course. Of course. I calmed down a little. I closed my eyes. Of, of course she didn't say those things. I'm just... It's me. It's always me. Of course it is. Um, uh, uh, speaking of Christmas, uh, I don't. W- I'm going to make sure I get you something. Don't, don't. Oh, thank you. That's very considerate of you, Jennifer. That's okay, isn't it, to get a gift from a patient? It's just a little thing. Of course, we're very close, you and me. That's okay. She stands up to uh, to again give you a hug. What do you do? I sort of go. Maybe not today, Dr. Finn. I'm sorry. That is all right, Jennifer. That is all right. I hope the coming few days will be will be good and uh, the preparations for Christmas will go according to plan. I, uh, yes, I look forward to our next session. Oh, I think we have it booked already. Yes, next, next week. I look forward to it. Of course, and I sigh a little and start to leave the office try and think of what I'm supposed to do today the uh you know the help of course will come in and 
do the shopping. She'll do that. I feel a bit guilty because I can never remember her name. You start moving out of the the office, and uh, this session with Dr. Finn was... It was not as good as the others, was it? You usually feel better when you leave. You feel sort of more together. But not this time, right? No. No, I feel... I feel like I've just... I'm losing progress. She said I was making progress. I don't feel I am. I've been doing so well. It's been almost a few years now. I've been doing fine. Kind of. Why now? Oh, is it actually Christmas? It's not like Christmas is exactly a pleasant time. I mean, okay, maybe the students, maybe they'll get me something. It's not like I have any family to spend it with. And you're thinking that, and you're walking down the street towards where the cab will pick you up, and you feel someone grabbing you by the neck, and they're pressing your throat hard. You smell the the stench of urine and filth. It's that homeless person from earlier. The stink, it it overwhelms you. She's grinning at you with a half-toothless mouth. What do you do? I scream and I'm just filled not only with panic at this attack but of course something so much more is t- touching me and I see the chains I see the grasping hands they want to pull me under I will strike at this f- person you can't take me you can't take me and I will sh- with my hands just try and claw at this attacker then I would like you to engage in combat. Eighteen. You're going to be able to fight off this attacker, but I'd like to give you a choice. You said that you were doing it with your hand. Was it your hand, or did you have something in your pocket, perhaps? Of course I did. I had my keys. I didn't even realize I'd grabbed them. But I have, haven't I? I've struck this woman in the face with my key. You have, and, and she's bleeding quite profusely from her from her chin. You've made a hole in it, and she just stares at you with these wide open eyes, and she says, You have to help the girl in the hospital. You have to make it right. And you can roll to keep it together. Twelve. That is twelve. I become guilt-ridden and lose one stability. I am filled with shame. It's just some crazy woman. But I've struck her in the face. I just... Please stay away from me. Just stay away. I'm sorry. Stay, stay away. And I just... I run to get the cab. And you run to get the cab, your bloody keys in hand. Vahid Harimi. You too have been dreaming. You have seen the dream of the girl with the cards. And when all becomes black from that breaker, or that lever, whatever it is, when all becomes black, you are... You are back on the fields near Alamara. You know, the place where your soul died. It's before dawn, and it is... It's cold. So very cold. The commander, Ali, is a boy of maybe 19 years old. He's told you that the Ayatollah has blessed you. He is with you in spirit, and Allah will surely bring you swift victory on this day against the... The murderers of the Prophet's grandson. They started this, but you will end it. Around you, around you are a group of boys your age. Some around 13 and others 15 or older. There's an old man with you also. Grandpa, you call him. The youngest is Arvin, 12. He looks up to you. He reminds you a little bit of your, your cousin, Ibrahim. Ali raises the the flag to signal advance. You always see this, this part especially. You begin to, you begin to march in straight lines towards the enemy positions. 
There's no artillery, no air support, it's just you. It's the hundred buzzish volunteers, fueled with the holy fire of Allah. And you're thrown to the ground as a mine explodes, tearing the legs off of Sasan. And I rear and I roar. As I fall down, I... 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 I feel the ground, and I feel the bit of shaking, and the dirt falling down around me. And I look, and I see the legs being torn off. And he screams from mother, Maman, Maman. But this is for our mothers. This is for our fathers. This is for Allah. We are doing this for a good thing. We have to break them. Together we will succeed. And I get up, and I start running. Yes. And you, you start running, and, and the others are running with you. You must keep going now, or you will all die. And Arvin is by your side. He's, he's crying silently. You can, you can see it. Mortar fire begins exploding around you. Arvin, come on, run, run! We have to get there. And I clasp the bayonet that I've been holding in my hand, that I've been holding so tightly ever since I won it from one of our earlier battles. <laughs> the mortars are exploding all around you. It hits, it hits the line of, of boys, blood, guts, and, and screams. Always the screams. Maman, maman. The Iraqi positions start opening fire, and Ali yells his war cry, and, and you know, you're now storming all ahead, full speed. Arvin is no longer by your side. Arvin! Arvin! I turn around and I look... But I don't have time. You wake up. You always wake up at this point when you look back. Hey, you you all right? You zoned out there for a bit. You're in the bathroom at Forbidden Nights. You hear the beats of Prodigy. Everybody in the place. It's a song. It can be heard from the club outside. Who is it that's saying this to you? It's uh, Andrea Giancelli. The Italian actor who waits the tables here. What are you doing in here, Andrea? You're supposed to be serving Margaret. Sorry, I just had to, had to hit the, the head a bit here. Uh, you, you, are you okay? I'm good. I'm good. I just need to wash my face. All right. Well, I know that the, the customers are, are are certainly waiting. So, uh, hey, let's uh, let's make you get a good night, huh? Let's uh, let's uh, let's earn some money. Hmm. I've got Margaret tonight. It should be fine. <laughs> uh, if you say so. And uh, he moves out of the bathroom. And, uh, well, when you're ready, uh, I suppose you will move back there. Can you describe this club? What what kind of place is there? this? And, and what are you doing here? I'm looking into the mirror for a while. Looking at myself. Seeing... Seeing my clean clothes... Me being back here, I see the discreet gold jewelry in my ears, the small little buds, and I'm back. And I'm back to a place where I'm in power, to a place where I'm in command. People come here and they want me, they want me so much, but they can only have what I decide to give. The Forbidden Nights is a club I've been working at for a few years. And, well, it's given me good money from something I never thought would bring me money. The scars that I have with me from the wars, the physical scars, that's what they come to see. We are a few people working here. Maybe sometimes we have some guest strippers coming in as well. We dance, sometimes openly in the club, but the most money is from the private sessions. The private rooms at the back of the club, that's what they will pay really well. I love it. It makes me feel alive for a while. I have some friends here. Zeno is a good boss. The Russian stripper, Andre is good too. <laughs> he's a bitch, but he's fun. We have Dana at the bar, Kostyatin at the door, and then of course Andrea cleaning away at the tables. And usually, it's very nice. I zone out, but sometimes I go to bad places. I think this to myself and I, uh, I hit myself on the cheeks. 
come on, it's show time, I tell myself. And I start heading back towards uh, one of the back rooms. I go past the uh, purple satin, the uh, nice hangings on the walls, the drapes of the closed off tables. I uh, wink at some of the customers at the table that were hoping to see me tonight, but tonight I have a private audience. <laughs> it's an old lady. As I come in and uh, I come into the room where she expects me to dance, we've already been talking for a while before I had to excuse myself. There's something about tonight, I don't know why, but I feel like I have trouble staying focused. But it doesn't matter. When we get to dancing, I know I will deliver anyway. So, I uh, come in, I see her sitting there in the satin couch, expectantly looking at me, looking at the platform and the table. And I get up, I uh, take her gaze. And I keep her completely glued to me. I know where she will look. Like an illusionist moving, I direct. I am in the middle of the symphony. And all that she can see is me, my body. And as my clothes dance around me, slowly she will see the scars. And I will see her disappear to another place as well. A place where there is nothing but me. And so we go on. And suddenly it's over. I'm done for the night. I come out, outside. I uh, look at the other side of the street. I pick out a cigarette. I say goodbye to Kostiantin at the door <laughs> he's happy the night's over he only comes here because well it pays a little extra to keep him just standing there open the door politely he's a good friend of Zeno so it's no surprise that he's here on the other side of the street I see Hamed I nod to him and uh, he's almost a copy of me dark blue jeans a white shirt, nice contrast against his uh, olive skin. Ahmed, Hi. are we going out or what? Of course, Wait, of course. The night is ours. And you, you go out, and you have a great time. You always have a great time with Ahmed. But all good things must come to an end, right? And... You must get back home. You must get back to the fruit store. You get there in the very, very early hours of the morning. The sun has begun to rise. And your dad, Mohammed, he has started preparing for today's business. His hands are rough from decades of hard work, face worn and wrinkly. But he's wearing an iron shirt and dress pants. Every day he gets up in the middle of the night to iron that shirt to, to show respect to his customers, to show respect to himself. He isn't what he used to be back in Iran, the, the patriarch of the large wealthy family who drove the nice car and could give generous gifts to everybody. He's had to change in the new land, to learn new things and do anything that could put food on the table. But in his heart he is who he has always been. And he has had a modicum of success. This isn't the only store he owns. He does this out of habit, you suppose. You haven't necessarily been able to figure it out completely. He sees you, but he doesn't say anything as you come back. He probably doesn't approve of what you do, right? He seeing you party until the early hours of the morning, he must at some point have voiced his opposition to that, right? He has not been so sure about how to deal with me because he hasn't been there for me. He hasn't really been much of a father at all. He 
was the one that got away. He got away before the war started, going ahead for the rest of our family, but none of us could follow once hell erupted in Iran. But he's also the one that was able to get you here. And just as you were about to go in inside the apartment building, he, he looks to you and he smiles. Good night, son. The, the look that he gives you is the, the one only a parent can give their children. It's, it's filled with genuine love, and you understand him. You, you were lost. He thought you dead, and now you're back alive. His only son, his flesh and blood, by his side on the other side of the world, away from the war and destruction, safe. He will always love you. You know this, no matter what. How does that make you feel? It makes my eyes sting. It makes me feel a pang of guilt. Though I don't know what to do with it, so in my mind it becomes something else. He's, he's pathetic to me. He, he lets himself get overwhelmed with feelings that are not supposed to be there. He didn't see me grow up, become a young man. He didn't see the horrors that I went through. He doesn't know me. How can he love me like this? I don't understand it. And I know even now that he has... He has ironed a second shirt. And I know that he will wait for me to come down to take my place. Behind the counter, I'm supposed to help him out today. And I know he doesn't approve. I'm just gonna... I'm just... It's gonna have to be a long day. He doesn't always stay by the counter. Usually, actually, there's someone else there. It's Farad, and he can cover for me, you know. He's, he'll say, I'll come in anyway. But when my father is there, there's no cover. As I I go up, I, uh, I have some coffee, and I uh, have something to eat. I then come down, and I... I go into the side room, the staff room, which is basically not more than a little wardrobe where he keeps the extra shirts and a place where you can take the phone or do something else. And I change my shirt. It's a bit crinkly. It smells of smoke. And it smells of perfume from what happened later on during the night and I uh, get in the new iron shirt that he has prepared for me and I uh, I go out and I don't say anything to him I, I just start helping I know what he needs help with I'm going to start carrying the larger fruit crates and make sure they get out front and as you start carrying the larger fruit crates you see a familiar sight sleeping uh, on the side of the street, it's the the homeless man. He's he's always there, isn't he? He uh, has that shaggy and bearded face, the stump that is all that remains of his leg sticking out from a dirty blanket. By his side is that top hat that he always has on, and and next to him the box that it came in that he's curiously always carrying around, the box that always moves slightly as though something was alive inside of it. You saw many like him during the war. Amputees. Men who had given up their future, yet were still alive. He must have been handsome once, uh, a young man going to war for his country, only to be discarded as garbage when he came back as a useless amputee. He whimpers as if he's in pain, and he starts shaking. I uh, stop. First, when I see him, I get a sort of smile on my face. Stylish Darren, as we want to call him, because of that top hat. But now something is wrong. I uh, I uh, put the crate down and I go over and I start pushing him on the shoulder. Hey, Darren, Darren, 
you uh, you start pushing him, and he opens up his eyes, grabs a hold of you with his right hand, the, the right hand where the fingers aren't quite aligned after having been broken repeatedly by the torturers. His his eyes pierce right through you like they always do, and you feel his smell, metal and oil, always metal and oil. I tried to pull back. Wait. Theron, what's... Wait. You, you have to help her. She's so afraid. All alone in the hospital. Y- you, you know, only you can put things right. It's your fault, after all. I feel a hint of cold sort of coming across my back. And I get a shiver. Theron, come on, what's wrong? What, what are you doing? And uh, a raven sits on a telephone pole nearby and calls at you. And it is later. It is afternoon, Jen. You're standing before a hospital of some kind. An institution like the one you were in before. An old Victorian building. Just like the one you saw in the dream. Surrounded by a high wall covered by detection wires and a large gate. The sign says, Sandburn Psychiatric Hospital. There are a number of cars parked in the parking lot outside. Once this would have been the outskirts of the city, but no longer. It has now been engulfed by the city and is located in the middle of a rundown section of council flats southwest of Clapham. Jen, how did you end up here? Don't, don't you have a student you should be tutoring now? I do. How did I... I feel a moment of panic as I can't recall I got in the cab I was supposed to go home and wait for my uh, Mr. Bentley what am I doing here? I I, I, I look around Uh, what's going on? I'm clearly upset clearly yes, clearly you are upset and another car stops behind you Vahid, are you driving, or is someone driving you? Hmm. No, it's... I think it's Dad driving me. Hmm. Yes, how did you convince him to take you here? <sighs> well, I... Uh, I just told him that there was something that... Uh, I had forgotten. I had forgotten some friends that I need to... I mean, I... I don't know. No. But perhaps it doesn't matter. Because he would do anything that you ask anyways. At this point. And you get out of the car. And standing outside of this hospital on the other side of the road. Is a woman. And you see each other. And you feel something. Something in the back of your mind tingles. Feelings of camaraderie and brotherhood. But as though that was part of a memory locked in the deepest vault of your minds. You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we play the campaign... Taroticum for Cult Divinity Lost. Taroticum was written by Gunilla Junson and Mikael Petersen in 1992, with additional material for the 2018 edition by Petter Nalu, Matthias Redekson, and Alex Obernik. Cult Divinity Lost is published by Helmgast. The music was made by Atrium Carceri, featuring collaborations with Apocryphus, Herbst 9, Kama Heights, City's Last Broadcast, God Body Disconnect and Eldar, and was used with permission from their label, Cryo Chamber. You can find more delicious dark ambient at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel. Finally, a big thank you to, well, you, for making this campaign possible. It would not be possible without your generous support on Patreon. You give us so much energy, help us cover our costs, and open up time to record and edit. And remember, death 
is only the beginning.